And joining us tonight on Bonehead Weekly is Robert Latham Brown. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing great. Okay, now I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, you took oh, off really? your head? Yeah. Right, it must be the end. I'll go ahead and use this. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That works. There you go. I'm That's... so sorry, but that works so much. But you sound That's fantastic right. with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So when Chad told us that he booked you for the show, we got really excited. Yeah, really excited. Because our favorite thing to do is to talk to production people. Yeah, and you, of course, um, pretty much produced the yeah, 80s. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> from our childhood. And also, you were pretty much the person who told all of the ma uh, major people who made the movies that we love, no. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I mean... There were, there were there were a few no's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like having your own nickname given to you by Mel Brooks? You're, you're Mr. On Budget? That's what he called me. Um, just, I mean, he was making jokes, obviously. But uh, he, we brought in those movies, the, the three movies I did with him, we brought them in right, right to the money. And it was important for me to do that because he basically was producing them as well as directing them. And I just, he told me he couldn't go over budget. And so that was my, that was my, those were my marching orders. Which that was pretty fantastic considering yeah. how am amazing Spaceballs actually looks. Like, uh, <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, <laughs> well, I he has said before that Spaceballs cost more than even the films like exactly. uh, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, and Dracula Dead and Loving It that were made later. Spaceballs mm -hmm. still cost more than those movies. I'm not sure if that's accurate. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but but um, it's well, you need to know how we got our budget number for Spaceballs. You know, normally I, I'm given a script and I go off and I break it down and I think, well, what, what should I, how would I want to make the movie? What, what does it need to make it in an ideal way? And I come up with a number, which typically a studio will then say, you know, cut it by 25% or you know, just, it, it can only be this much. And so then I go back and I make it fit that. Um, in this instance, uh, the way we got the, the budget number was um, <clears throat> Mel was at a party and um, he was talking to uh, uh, Alan Ladd Jr., who was head of MGM at the time. Ladd. And he said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, I, I have this great idea for like a Star Wars, Star Trek uh, parody. He says, I'd, I'd really like to, to do this. And he pitched him on it and and Alan Led said sounds great what will it cost and Mel goes um and I think he happened to look over at the uh the 17th volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica and he said um 17 that's what it'll be 17 <laughs> <laughs> so um that's what the number I had. And I actually, when I budgeted it, it came in at less than 17. Um, and then, uh, and I told Mel, and he said, that's fine. Uh, and then he would get, because he says, because I'm going to get ideas, you know, during the movie. And I said, okay. And he, uh, well, for instance, one of the ideas he came up with is he wanted Dark Helmet to be caught up in an eating machine like uh, in Chaplin's Modern Times. Right, and right. He's going to, you know, have this machine feeding him and he's going to mm -hmm. get all messed up in it. And um, so he said, what will that cost? This was while we were shooting. And I said, I went off and worked it out. And it turned out it was, uh, I told him it was going to be $50,000 to build and shoot it. And he sat there and he thought for a second. And he said, it's not that funny. <laughs> says, if you had said 25,000, it's that funny, but it's not 50,000 funny. Yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, that's, I, I couldn't spend the money. I, and I told him, uh, I finally got half, you know, we were halfway through and you have to understand it's as big a sin to come in way under budget as it is to come in over budget as you know, people have raised that money and they're paying interest on it. And then if you don't use it, it's just a waste. And they expect a movie for that amount of money. So what um, I <clears throat> said to him is, uh, 
you know, Mel, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not spending the money. I'm going to have like 800,000 left over. And cause I can, you know, I can project ahead and see where I'm going to end up. And um, he said, don't worry about it. And I, that was strange to me. I didn't understand that until um, I later found out that he was going to get the 17 for the movie, regardless of what the movie cost. Um, that's why he definitely didn't want to go over because that's all he was going to get. But at the same time, anything, if we came in under, uh, any excess uh, would go to Brooks Films. So. Ah. <laughs> So that's uh, where we were. That's a good story. <laughs> that's a hell of a story to, yeah, to, to start, start off. off with. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Well, you guys must have developed a great relationship, though, because you ended up, you know, doing Men in Tights and Dead and Loving. Yeah. I, no, I, I really enjoyed working with him. And um, I was always able, I mean, I think he had confidence in, in that things were being handled. And that's what I wanted him to feel. I wanted him to feel that, I mean, one of the first things he said, uh, the first production meeting we had on Spaceballs, and obviously this is the first movie I ever did with him. He sat down, we had all the heads of the departments there, and, um, and he, he sat down at the head of the table, and he said, before we start, I want to know right up front who's scamming the caterer. <laughs> <laughs> so I- obsessed with food. Right. <laughs> so um, I I just uh, I wanted him to know that we weren't stealing from him, and that it was mm -hmm. it was it was all going to be good. Okay. So, so uh, well, I I kind of want to start from the beginning. I do too. Because you started out as a as a director and second unit director, if I'm not mistaken, right? Actually, I started out as an assistant director. Assistant director. Well, before we get there, Virginia, you're born in, and raised in Virginia? I was, yeah. Right. Well, up through junior high school, and yeah. then my family moved to Florida. We were, we moved to Melbourne, Florida, which is like south 20 Cocoa miles Beach. south of Cape Canaveral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My, my family, my mother grew up and, in Cocoa Beach in Maryland. Ah, okay. Yeah. And we used to see the astronauts in town and all that. We was and watch all the space shots. You know, they'd let us out of school and we'd watch the space shots. But yeah, yeah it was it was an, a great place to grow up. So it was Virginia and then Florida. So how did you end up in Hollywood? Where was the passion? That's what we usually ask. Oh, is, yeah. So where did it start out with? Where did the the love for movies? Give us your story. Oh. <laughs> Let's start. Okay. At the I, all right. I went to Tulane University. Uh, once I graduated from high school, I went to Tulane University and got a, I was, uh, I was a biology major in a pre-med program. And, uh, and I planned to be a doctor because I, that's what I had wanted to do my entire life. And while I was at Tulane, I got interested in the theater department. And that was when the Drama Review, I don't know if you know the publication, but it's now at the University of Pennsylvania. It was at Tulane then, because Tulane had this amazing theater department. And so um, when I got to, uh, I, I got to my senior year, the beginning of my senior year, I realized I started wondering why I wanted to become a doctor at that point, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I started realizing I wanted to do it for the money and the prestige. And, um, and I realized that wasn't a very good reason to become a doctor. If you want money and prestige, where do you go? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you go. Um, so when I went to, uh, I went to, I was in my physiology class and they were explaining the citric acid cycle for about the hundredth time. Well, and I, it was like the first week of classes. And I thought, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. So I went to the Dean and said, I want to change my major. And he said, okay, uh, what do you, what, what are you now? I said, biology pre-med. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to uh, have a major in theater and uh, acting and directing in the theater. And he said, okay, um, what, what year are you? And I said, I'm a senior. And he said, you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, but I can. And I showed him because I had already taken a bunch of theater courses ahead of that. And, um, and so um, he said, all right. Called my dad up, told him what I wanted to do. 
and he said, well, you got to follow what you follow your heart, you know, and really, I don't think he wanted to pay for med school. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So just a little bit, we have all worked, we all work with students yeah. and, and James and I both have worked in academic advising. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why I looked at you and go, really? He was, <laughs> he weren't going to med school. Because the stories I hear would be the opposite of. Ah, that. they want them to go to med school. Right? Yes, because they think that's the only way they can make money. Right. Yeah. And um, I knew I was jumping off into pretty much the unknown. There's no guarantees in, in right. theater or film. Mm -hmm. um, but it was something I really felt drawn to. And I really enjoyed it. I, I then got to the point. When I, after I graduated, um, I, did, I needed money to go someplace, you know, to, to further my training. So I, I taught in the Brevard County Public Schools for three years. <laughs> and during that time, I, I, I got the feeling that I, um, I mean, I, I started, I realized I had felt kind of limited in theater. Yeah. Um, you're, I mean, we, the Tulane Theater, you know, the, the small theater, we could seat 100 people. And, um, and, you know, I did a whole bunch of plays there, even before I switched majors. And, but I, I didn't have the imagination, I don't think, to understand what is possible on a stage. I didn't really realize in, that until I saw Les Mis. You know, I went, saw a huge production of that, you know, of, of off-Broadway production of that and um, saw what was actually possible, what people can do on a stage. And the other one that really impressed me was Sunset Boulevard. Oh, you yes. Start, you start off and you're at the bottom of the pool and you see the body floating above you, you know, I mean, you know up above the stage. You know. Right. And uh, um, I was, I had, I had never even realized you could do things like that. But before I experienced that, uh, revelation I really figured it it's my image of theater up to that point was you know waiting for Godot two guys on a stage with a dead tree and um, and I just didn't have the imagination to to take that further but I really enjoyed movies and um, I just I ate them up I just watched as many movies as I could get my hands on and um, of course Back then, it was basically I went to the Melbourne Theater to, to watch movies. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so um, I got this idea that I wanted to move out to California and go to you know go to film school. And at first, it was go either to to NYU or UCLA or USC. UC, Those yeah. were the, basically the choices. And there was a guy uh, I, I looked up see if to see if there's anybody who could advise me in florida and in miami was the ivan tour studios and they did they um did sea hunt and um, mm -hmm. they did uh, uh flipper mm -hmm. you know that sort of thing and there was a production manager there i called him up i said can i come talk to you and he said sure so i drove down there and um and just basically said, how do I get into this business? This is what I want to do. And where do you, you know, if I have to go to school, what school should I go to? And he basically also said, USC, NYU, UCLA. And, um, and I thought, well, I don't really want to go to New York. I'm not, you know, I've been to New York. I'm not that crazy about it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's very busy, very, you know, noisy. And, and so, um, I thought, well, I'll go to California. And uh, I went out to, uh, to US, well, I, I checked out USC first. I mean, I didn't go to California yet. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I started looking into a applying and I realized th that I couldn't afford USC. Uh, and, but I could afford US, uh, UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the time for in, the in-state tuition was, uh, I don't know, $1,200 a year, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so, so I applied to UCLA, to the theater department, and was rejected. Um, I, the, my wife at the time had actually been accepted at UCLA in their Germanic department. She was going to get her PhD in Germanic studies. 
And uh, so I said, well, let's just go anyway. So we drove out two cars, you know, both taking our cars <laughs> all the way out there. Um, and when we got to got there, I went to see the head of the theater department, Hugh Growl was his name. And uh, he was the dean of the, of the, not the theater department, the film department. And I, I made an appointment and I, when I met him, um, <clears throat> he asked me, you know, what, what did I want to talk about? And I said, well, I had applied and I hadn't been accepted and I wanted to find out where I was deficient so I could apply again the following mm -hmm. year. And he said, and he, I gave him a little bit of the story, you know, that I, I was, had been living in Florida and I'd moved out. And, and he said, you came all the way out here to talk to me? And I went, uh, yeah, that's what I did. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, <you know. laughs> and he, uh, he picked up the phone, called the admissions department, and had me admitted right there. Oh, great. Wow. So that I, I started I started a, a master's uh, program in production and about that time you know the students were all being really radicalized at this point it was 1970 I guess right. 70 to 71 at that point and um, the students had protested the film students had and because they wanted to own the copyright to their films and so the university said, okay, you want to own the copyright to your films, you pay for the equipment, you pay for the processing and the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can own the copyright to your films. And that's the policy they instituted. Well, suddenly I had no way to afford to make a movie. And this was like my second year there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I switched to writing. I changed my degree to an MFA in screenwriting. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time that year, I saw a notice on the bulletin board for the assistant director's training program uh, that first year. And I thought, well, I thought, well I'll, I'll apply. And I did. I applied. And then the following spring, I found out I went through an interview. They, they have you take this, this SAT test on steroids. It has a personality profile. It has all the normal SAT stuff, paragraph meaning, math, uh, vocabulary. Um, they have a vocational preference test in it. I mean, it goes on for like eight hours. You take this test. And ironically enough, they administered the test at USC. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the only time I got in there. <laughs> but um, the, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get in that first year. And I thought, well, this worked with UCLA. I'll call them up and ask them where I was deficient. <laughs> so I said, okay, where was I deficient? And I want to apply again and they said it was your test scores you did great on the interview it was the test scores so I said okay um, I got myself an SAT prep book and studied up on the math because I knew that was where I was most mm -hmm. efficient and uh, the net following year um, I actually got the highest score wow. out of 1500 people and so um, I was part of a class of 15 and uh, they assigned me to my first picture, which uh, was the Hindenburg being directed by Robert Wise mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, you know, George C. Scott and Bancroft. And, and I didn't even know Anne Bancroft was married to anybody at that point. Right. I had no idea. <laughs> you know? All I knew is I was working with Mrs. Robinson. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Not Mrs. Brooks. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm being reminded that I, th this is something that, that, I don't know, a lot of people maybe who are listening to this might find this uh, valuable. I, whenever I've gotten to a point in my life where I need to make a choice or I'm trying to break through a barrier, yeah. I just find as many different avenues as I can to try and, you know, as many doors as I can to, to knock on figuring one of them is going to open. In this instance, when I was uh, at UCLA, I was trying to get my friends to get come together. And, we were, and I was going to have, you know, my idea was to make uh, public service uh, 
announcements, you know, for, mm -hmm. for local television stations and just give the film to them just as long as they would credit us. I mean, this was my yeah. level of thinking at the time. The other thing was I had uh, sent a script to William Morris mm -hmm. uh, from my screenwriting um, looking for representation and that and then I applied for the second time to the assistant director's training program because I had no idea how I was going to get into this business. It just, uh, it seemed like there was just a wall there. So that same week as I got accepted to the training program, I also uh, got into the, uh, I was accepted by William Morris for a year's representation and I had to make a choice. Um, the agent who was going to represent me was Ron Mardigian, who later became head of their literary department mm -hmm. um, and a uh, very nice man who also ended up teaching at USC. <laughs> so <laughs> finally, <laughs> but, um, and my idea about getting my friends together to form a little film company, nobody was interested. So uh, we didn't do that. So I chose the assistant director's training program because at the end of the two years training, I would be a member of the director's guild. Um, and That's they pay, yeah. yeah, they paid you to train. You know, I was, I was getting more, I was getting $90 a week, which was more money than I had ever seen in my life. Uh, so I was thrilled. <laughs> but, and from that point on, they, what they do is, um, they you train you they train you for 400 days a hundred only a hundred days of that can be prepped the rest has to be shooting mm -hmm. and they train you to be an assistant director right so what i'm hearing is is that you just wanted to work in film you didn't have did yes. you want to be like i had like a lot of people that i have to be a director i have to be a writer you know what i mean i want to be a producer that, that right. doesn't sound like that was you at all no, it, w it wasn't. Um, I mean, every kid who wants to go into film pretty much wants to be a director. Right. And I had dreams of being a director. Once I got into it and I saw, you know, to tell you the truth, at 27, I didn't have, I, I, I didn't feel that I had a lot to say either as a writer or a director. Yeah. But I knew I wanted to get into the business. Mm -hmm. Um. And I knew I needed to live a little bit to, to have something to say, because I just wasn't sophisticated in any way. Yeah. And um, so I, that's, you know, to get into the, to be actually the assistant director on a, on a Hollywood movie was, was huge for me. And, and later to become a production manager and a mm -hmm. line producer and so on, those were dreams being fulfilled for me. Right. So who were some of your contemporaries you were in school with that we may know? Because there's always, oh, by the way, I had classes with X who went on to do Z. Right? Well, um, actually, in, I was the, the student, um, uh, student uh, teaching assistant for the camera 101 or, or the beginning camera course you yeah. know, at, in the graduate school. And one of my, I don't know if you'll even know this name, but one of my students was Ed Ames, really? the singer. Oh, Ed really? Ames, you know. mm -hmm. But um, there's another uh, guy named Mike Adrian is, uh, I recently connected with him. I acted in his student film uh -huh. uh, there and he's, he's putting together uh, an independent film with music. I think it, it's, it's, um, He's out in Texas at the time. For a long time, he worked as one of those helicopter traffic guys. Um, uh huh. Oh, okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. so, so, let's start going through some of your films here. Mm -hmm. the, uh, let, we start out with because it is so long. I don't know exactly where I want to start at. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to start at the Ellen. I don't know. <laughs> I tell you one that you've never been asked about, and can I go ahead and do it? Go for it. That's going to be in the middle, and I pulled out the poster. It's the original one sheet. So <laughs> right. I have a feeling you've never actually been asked about this movie. 
Okay. So fortuitous because I just bought this one sheet accidentally, well, not accidentally, but just accidentally found it the other day. And I was like, mm -hmm. these two have never seen it. And I think I'm the only person from the 80s who's seen this movie. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you remember yeah, it? I do side? remember it. Yes, I do. Okay. I had, so here's what else is funny about this. Hadn't seen it in 20, 30 years since I was mm -hmm. 41 years old. So I, Probably hadn't seen it since I was a kid, and I probably shouldn't have saw it as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Watched it six months ago. Asked them. No, they've never seen it. Happened to be at a friend's. Um, so we moderate a lot of cons, conventions, mm -hmm. comic cons, and things like that. One of the uh, owners is a friend of ours, and he has three or four shops, and he got all these movie posters in. He wanted us to come look at them and mm -hmm. tell him what, what's original, what's not, one sheets. We can do a little bit of that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and sure. I found it. It was like, I have to have it have to bring it home and then it wasn't a week later he chad books you so oh, right. a warning sign story how did you get involved in warning sign the movie from the 80s that i'm really the only one who was ever watching <laughs> well thank you for watching it well it no was, I, uh, I think it holds up pretty well have you seen it in a long time yeah it did i haven't no richard dysart's in that is that correct yeah okay yeah mm -hmm. um I was not enamored of that movie when we were making it. It was <laughs> basically, I was assigned to, to do it and I went and did it. <laughs> it was a job. Um, yeah. But it, um, the actors, I, I enjoyed working with the actors. They were very nice people. The, um, I just remember the scenes inside the facility mm -hmm. where they were, I almost felt like we were doing, you know, a, a vamp, I mean, not a, a, a zombie movie. It is know? very much like a zombie yeah. movie, but it isn't a zombie movie. No, it's not. Right, right. But, uh, and it, I, I felt it was a little silly, to yeah. tell you the truth. <laughs> but, but, you know, any time, whatever films I worked on, I always try to make them as good as I can. And the director of photography was Dean Cundy. That's true. That's the first time I ever got to work with Dean, I believe. Right. So Dean from John Carpenter Films. Who, right. And it seems like you worked on a John Carpenter film. Yeah. I wasn't going to get to that right now, but since I brought up <laughs> Dean Cundy. Yeah. The Thing. Yeah. yeah the thing. The so Thing. That had to have been a crazy movie to try, <laughs> try to produce. <laughs> that one, that was a challenge. It really was. Um, <laughs> We had a very unusual problems. For instance, the interior of the Norwegian camp was shot on stage. And yeah. of course, it's been open to the elements. It's in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And it, you're, it's supposed to be really cold. Well, we were shooting that in July in LA. And it was like 110 outside. Right. And, but John wanted uh, to be able to see the actor's breath to make it look like it was cold. Now, my understanding is if you're really in the Arctic, it's so dry that your the moisture in your breath immediately goes into solution in the atmosphere, so you don't see people's breath. But it's kind of like binocular mats. You don't really <coughs> see uh, through binoculars with two circles. You see one, you know, but it it's film shorthand. It's Visually, you know that you're looking through binoculars. Visually, right. you see the breath, you know, oh, it's cold in there. Exactly. <laughs> right. So my big problem was how to make it cold, look cold, how to, how to make, uh, make it possible to photograph the, the people's breath. So what we finally discovered is we could take the swamp cooler air conditioners. Uh, we had like five of them. Yeah. Normally you have one on a stage. We brought in five, got the stage down to, I believe, <clears throat> 43 degrees or 44 degrees mm -hmm. and, um, and had misters up in the permanence uh, in the rafters there yeah. um, to take the, the humidity up to 80%. And under those conditions, if you backlight it, you can see people's breath. So I had the crew working in parkas, mm -hmm. uh, just like we were, were like if we were up in the ice field, and um, and then of course they'd go out to this 110 heat when they left the stage, and everybody got sick. Everyone did. 
Yeah, I've heard that before. But I would imagine which one was easier, being there or going up to the, to the ice fields to shoot the exteriors? Well, the ice fields had their own problems, obviously, because right. we had to prep all the cameras. We had to have, uh, you know, uh, thin, especially thinned oil to lubricate the cameras. We had to keep the batteries heated. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was just all kinds of problems. Have to we had to get special navy surplus cold weather gear for the crew because um, we were shooting on a glacier we had two instances we were shooting on a glacier outside stewart british columbia mm -hmm. which was a uh, the reason we went there it's the only glacier in north america that you can drive up onto because having to move everything by helicopter would have been prohibitive um, so we were able to drive trucks up. We were the first ones doing uh, ice trucker roads or what, <laughs> I, whatever it was. We actually did that. <laughs> but um, the, you can drive up this ramp. You go, you leave Brit Stewart, BC, you cross the border into Hyder, Alaska, and then you turn right and you go up this mining road along this cliff, thousands of feet high. Um, until back into Canada, and that's where we there were, there's an ice field up there, a glacier, and we were able to go up there and film. Um, we also were were using helicopters as well to move actors up and down, and to in for you know to, to whenever we had to move something fast, we were able to do that with these two helicopters. So I had become a private pilot by that time, and um, so I was really conscious of air safety and that sort of thing. And I set up, uh, I had a controller in Stewart where the helipad was and um, it, who was in radio contact with both helicopters. And then, so what he would do is, is make sure we had no mishaps because there had been a, a show there a year before that had shot in Stewart and they did have a, a helicopter crash. And oh. uh, so I was really, conscious of that and we had no no accidents at all it went very well well that's great to hear but it's also so there were no near-death experiences <laughs> no, it's, glacier? well i'll tell you one we did okay. have um the other thing that i've always tried to do is be prepared for the worst right. um and uh because and so when i'm looking at this ice field up there i'm thinking well what happens if we get if it starts snowing or the weather comes in so badly i can't fly the helicopters i can't drive that ice road which has a thousand foot drop on one side of it and um and i i have my crew up there for the night what's going to happen so i had this brilliant uh local uh tech advisor. He, he's a snow tech advisor, basically. His name is Robin Mounsey. He lives in, in uh, British Columbia. And um, he, I, I told him the, the concerns I had, and, and he said, well, we'll just make it so that we have the supplies we need to camp out there overnight. And he says, and I'll be with them and if, if that should happen. And so, uh, we put together this uh, camp uh, up near the set and uh, they didn't, you know, one night we were wrapping late and then the weather was starting to come in and we couldn't get the helicopters up there and it looked like they were going to have to spend the night. So Robin got the cast and everybody into this camp right. um, and then the weather cleared and we were able to use the helicopters to bring them down. But oh, so no near death, but just an instance where we could have had a problem. Now, before, before we move on, John Carpenter went on to get his uh, helicopter license as well. Are you the guy that got him into that? Um, I think John had always wanted to do, no, I wasn't the one, but he knew I had gotten my pilot's license. Mine's fixed wing. I, okay. I'm not, I, but, um, but he, he I, he enjoys helicopter flying. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was the movie that I was in my only uh, airplane uh, collision. That was uh, we were scouting. Yeah, up there. What What's happened? That? I said, "What happened?" We, 
Oh, <laughs> we were um, scouting up near Ketchikan um, and uh, we were, let's see what we were doing. We were uh, coming, we, we had to land at, we were coming back to LA, but so, but so we were in these little bush planes, these, uh, I think they're, be they call them beavers, mm -hmm. they're float planes. Mm -hmm. And um, when, and it's kind of wild flying with these Canadian bush pilots um, because we, like I was in uh, one plane and then um, Larry Franco and the assistant director and John Carpenter were in the mm -hmm. plane ahead and we were following them uh, through those mountains around Ketchikan. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was really misty and like uh, some snow falling and, uh, and all of a sudden, I saw the plane ahead of us do this, this really steep bank and, and turn like that. And I looked at my pilot and I said, well, why did they do that? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, the clouds parted and there's a mountain there. And I said, oh, that's why. <laughs> and we, so we did the same. <laughs> but um, we landed in Ketchikan. And... Um, uh, this was at a, another instance. Uh, we were in a Grumman Goose, which is a two, twin engine plane uh, with high wings and a, again, a, a seaplane. It looks like what they call, used to call a flying boat. Mm -hmm. And um, we were uh, going to leave there. What, it, what was going to happen? We had had to land in Ketchikan, go to the dock, clear customs, clear American customs, and then um, we were going to load back into the Grumman Goose and he was going to take off and land at the airport. And, uh, and then we were going to catch a plane back to LA. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so after we had cleared customs, we're all sitting there in this uh, <laughs> Grumman Goose uh, against the, the dock. And there was another plane ahead of us yeah. in, in, at the dock. And um, the our pilot had told the line boy, he had a line attached to the tail of the plane. He said, hold on to this. I'm going to swing the plane out away from the dock and then you let go and, and we'll go off and we'll take off. Well, I don't know what this pilot was thinking, but with a real airplane on cement, if you want to turn right, you can put, you can, um, press the right brake and rev your engine up and it'll swing you around to the right. But there's no brakes on the water. So I guess he thought the line boy was going to do that for him. But so what he did is he, um, he revved up the left engine and the line boy couldn't hold the rope because the plane was pulling so hard. And we started moving forward towards the other airplane. And we were drifting out a bit too, uh, away from the dock as that was happening. And um, I was just looking out the window and Carpenter was looking out the window <laughs> and Franco, and we were just sort of sitting there thinking, we're gonna hit that airplane. <laughs> and, um, and sure enough, our propeller started chewing into the tail of that airplane. Mm. So our pilot shut down the engines. And now at this point, we're bobbing out into the bay. We're going you know, floating away from the dock. People are streaming down onto the dock, you know, furious and screaming and yelling. And um, we had, um, there was a Japanese freighter that was anchored in the bay, lined with sailors, with the crew, and they, every one of them had a camera and they were all taking pictures of this. And I thought, well, in our pilot, he, he gets out of, out of the pilot seat and he, he opens a trap door uh, above where the wing is um, and he climbs up onto the top of the plane and he goes over to that left engine and starts shaking the propeller. And I'm thinking, well, you know, after a, a prop strike, you're supposed to have the engine completely torn down before mm -hmm. you fly again. So what he's doing is he's just checking to see if there's any obvious damage. And I assume we're going to go back to the dock and, uh, and we'll find another way to get to the airport, <laughs> you know? No. So he gets back in the seat. He re starts everything up and he starts making these great big circles in the bay, 
going faster and faster. And I thought, well, he's just, I guess he just kind of wants to test the engine, but then he's going to shut it down. We'll go over to the dock and be normal people. And, <laughs> um, and no, he kept going and going and then he took off. And, uh, and I was petrified at that point because I could just see the engine exploding and, you know, the, I didn't know if the crankshaft was cracked or what, you know, but he landed us at the airport and, um, and I said, you're going to go back to that dock and settle up with those people. Right. And he goes, Oh yes, yes, I will. I hope he did. I did. <laughs> I heard about it. Mm -hmm. So, so the thing is, you know, one of those great horror movies and warning signs, but I want to talk to you about... I wouldn't say warning uh, signs is a great horror film. <laughs> I just wanted, I film, wanted to be the right? one man who asked you about warning signs. Right. Has well, anyone else ever just... asked? <laughs> no. Okay. No one has. No one has. The, uh, <laughs> you were the unit production manager on one of my all-time favorite musicals, The Blues Brothers. I would imagine uh, okay. that's a very different type of filmmaking experience than making the thing or doing something like that. I was just wondering if you had any stories about uh, just because of the musical talent involved or, or what was the setup on that? Or working with John Landis. Yeah. <laughs> you, or wrangling maybe, John Belushi. <laughs> this could take three hours. Oh, <laughs> we we got it. We, we got, got it. I, I got time. I <laughs> got it. If we talk about no other movie, this sounds fantastic. Um, it could take no, I mean, there's a lot of stories um, about it. It was it was a challenge. That was the um, that was probably the the one that was one of the toughest films I'd worked on. That uh, was like it, your third film as a unit production manager, if I'm not mistaken. Right. What had happened is. There was a very experienced, very talented production manager on the film originally. His name was Tom Joyner. And um, he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was making the film that was budgeted. And it was like the first week of shooting. Um, and he and, and Landis had a different idea. Landis wasn't making the movie that was budgeted. He was making a bigger movie. And... Um, so Tom and, and John were, were having uh, a lot of problems, you know, working together. And finally, John got him fired. And uh, they picked me to replace Tom. So they sent me up to Chicago, and I started looking through everything and, and started getting the lay of the land and, and figuring out what was going on. And so I called the studio up and I said, well, you fired Tom for doing his job. What is it you want me to do? And they said, well, minimize the damage. And I said, I feel like you put me on a beach, said there's a tidal wave coming in and I'm supposed to minimize the damage. I yeah. said, that's how I feel. I said, if he's not going to listen to you, he's certainly not listening to me. And they said, well, just do the best you can. And I said, okay. So, um, I mean, they were, had a lot of, uh, of high expectations on this movie because John was so successful with Animal House. Mm -hmm. And um, in Animal House, I think, it made $65 million and it only, it, I don't, it didn't cost hardly anything. I mean, it was right. a pittance. So, I mean, Blues Brothers uh, ended up going 75% over budget. Wow. And uh, don't tell Mel. I, I wouldn't want him to hear that. <laughs> no, it, it was it was it was the second most expensive movie that year, right? Or the most? I think so. Movie? Yeah, yeah. I'd say I know it had the most car crashes of any movie of all time for a long, yeah, time. long time. We had. I mean, the stories go on and on with that. Um, what's a good one? What's what's? And I know you could you could just talk about tons, but. I mean, what, what, is it an ego thing? What's uh, people uh, at the height of their fandom? Well, there's a, we were deep. I mean, we had some really talented people on that movie. And uh, I mean, and I mean, really great people too. I mean, like John Belushi was a really nice person. I mean, okay. I really enjoyed working with him. But for instance, I got a call from him. I mean, we we were going to shoot 
we had a shot to do in the daytime and then we were going to work in to most of the night um it, it was called a day day into night shoot mm -hmm. and um we were the the day shot was going to be out in harvey illinois you know west of chicago yeah and um we were and then we were going to uh, do night work in harvey as well and so um <clears throat> i got a call that morning from john uh john belushi and he wanted to know did we really have to go did we really have to go uh, at rush hour? Do we, do we have to leave you know, to, to drive out to this location at rush hour and get all weirded out in traffic was how he put it. And I said, yeah, we do. We actually do have to do that. <coughs> we get that day shot and then we're going to go into the night work. Uh -huh. And um, he said, well, what about a helicopter? And I laughed. I said, John, we can't afford a helicopter. You know, I'll see you out there, okay? And he goes, okay. Well, he didn't show. He didn't make it. He got there in time for the night work, but he didn't show for the day work. So we were going to be there again the next day. So I said, okay, we're going to have to do the day work today, <laughs> on this right. next day. Um, it was that kind of thing uh, that was, it was just trying to herd the, trying to corral all the cats, basically. Yeah. So. So was was not pleasant working with John Landis or was it just a, he wanted what he wanted? Well, he wanted what he wanted, but I was very, I mean, I enjoyed working with John Landis. Um, he, I mean, I remember one time he came in to my office uh, at the hotel there in Chicago and he said, I need a day of rehearsal for such and such a scene. And um, and he's and I'm thinking while he says that I'm, I'm thinking you know he probably does and and I said you're right I think you do need the day of rehearsal and he kept arguing why he needed the day of rehearsal I said yeah John I agree you do need the day of rehearsal and he wasn't hearing that right <laughs> he, he he thought I was fighting with him I said no absolutely I think you should have the day of rehearsal and um, and he goes oh okay. Well, all right, and then he, he left. <laughs> but the big fight I had with him was, um, I mean, he is passionate about the movies he makes and what he needs to see on the screen. Right. And so we had this, I don't know if you remember the, the scene where Henry Gibson, the neo-Nazi, mm -hmm. and his henchmen are in the Pinto and they go off the freeway mm -hmm. and they're falling forever, mm -hmm. you know, in the sky. And, and Henry Gibson's throttling the henchman while that's going on. Mm -hmm. So um, to do that, the way John wanted to shoot that was to suspend the Pinto below a helicopter on a long line with um, Henry Gibson and the other actor in the car and fly them through the streets of Chicago. Yeah. And I said, that's one time I said, no, you can't do it. I said, absolutely not. We can't, I mean, you're gonna risk these people's lives and uh, the FAA will never give us a permit. It's just not gonna happen. And we had a big fight about that. And I said, you know, every other movie in the history of film has done this through rear projection back then you know mm -hmm. and uh he he said no uh, he says i i hate rear projection and i said i'm sorry i don't know then find another way to do it but you can't fly henry gibson through the streets of chicago <laughs> you'll you'll kill him i i said the first thing the pilot's going to do if he has engine trouble he's going to drop his load and henry gibson is the load so, <laughs> the other act. So, <laughs> so he he finally relented and um, and he did it with rear projection. That's how it how it was done. We did it on stage in L.A. I just that I can't imagine like I, if you had been able to pull that off, I would have loved mm -hmm. to see the meeting with Henry Gibson going. Okay, here's the deal: <laughs> we're going to put you in the mm -hmm. and fly you through the streets of right. Chicago. I I, 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 I could I, not. The actor would want to do that. Uh, I in, I would never be able, in good conscience, to even ask that. Okay. I mean, I it, my philosophy has always been: it's only a movie. Uh, yes. You know, there's no 
point in anybody getting hurt or killed, you know, making right. it. So, uh, so I'm, I guess um, I'm going to, Joe brought up warning signs. So I'm going to bring up another movie that I, you might not get a lot of questions about, but James brought up a road movie. So I'm going to bring up a road movie and that would be uh, your work on busting loose. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think, did I do all the, all of busting loose? Well, yes. cause, I, cause I was kind of curious about the, there were some issues with, like, I Scott is listed as the director, but Michael Schultz apparently did some work on it and he, he okay. He, then uh, yeah, I worked with Michael Schultz. Uh, he came in and, and did additional uh, filming. Uh, okay. That's he's what one of the, He's one of these iconic film directors that I don't think gets enough credit for the work that he's done. Right. Um, um yeah, that, that was, uh, a, that was, I, I didn't do the entire movie. I, I just okay. did that post-production shooting at, with Michael. And, um, that's okay. We can, um, we can move yeah. on. To no, that's okay. Uh, well, I kind of curious you're talking about that. So a question that we do ask people and we don't, I guess in a way it comes off as gossip, but I mean, clearly this is an interview. Who have you worked with that you would never work with again? And who is a positively on a positive note, who was one of the best people you've ever worked with? I'd say Mel Brooks is one of the best. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he, I really enjoy working with him. He is a great guy. He's very generous. He's, uh, Oh, I'm being told I did all of Busting Loose. So, oh, there you go. <laughs> well, like I said, with a career like yours, it's hard to keep <laughs> all that straight. Well, we can talk about, we'll get back to Richard Pryor in a second, because I was mm. hoping you'd have a good Richard Pryor story with that. <laughs> well, I, I actually do. <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, we'll come back to who's the worst. You tell your Richard Pryor story. Okay. Well, my, it's, it's an unfortunate story. Um, it's just that, Richard's um, his assistant, you know, the guy who takes care of him on the set and goes and gets right. him stuff and all that. Um, he was turning in, uh, he, was, he was getting a lot of petty cash. And typically the way you, this works on a movie is that when you, you, you get a petty, you, you get issued some petty cash um, and then you turn in receipts if you want to get more petty cash, but you, you, have to, you have to account for the money you've spent already before you get more money. Well, he kept getting petty cash without getting any receipts and the accountant came to me and told me about this. Um, and so I, <coughs> I went to him and, uh, and I asked him, well, what, what, you know, where are your receipts? We need to see them. And he, he got real upset and he got angry with me. This is the assistant. Did. Right. And, um, and then later, Richard Pryor came to me and started calling me a racist because I was singling out his assistant uh, and right. giving him this hard time. And I explained to him, I said, I, you know, it has nothing to do with race. The fact is, all I'm interested in is the receipts. And I demand them of everybody on the show mm -hmm. who has petty cash. And uh, and he he calmed down after that, but I eventually got the receipts. <laughs> there you go. I thought this was going to go someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was going to go into drugs, and I thought it was going to go there quick. <laughs> Sorry. He was actually. This was after he had gotten so badly burned. Yeah. You know, he had recovered from that, and that was from his use of drugs. That that yeah, that right, accident right, happened, right, right, right. and so he was. Um, he was very well, I mean, I guess compared to, to how other people had, the dealings other people had had, with him, he was actually very well, easy to work with for me. Um, I got on well with him. Uh, but it, it, I think a lot of it had to do with his accident. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, he, he got severe burns. Are you going to ask about? Yeah, so so um, after the thing, you did the Iceman, which was a, a but um, right after the Iceman, you worked on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, um, right. and, and as in the USA location, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. I mean, how was that? I mean, you went from, I mean, just Indiana Jones is one of those iconic characters, and Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg, of course. Mm -hmm. so you had, it was it was great fun. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed working with Steven. That was. <laughs> um, I mean, I learned a lot working with Stephen. For instance, we were going to shoot the Hong Kong airport. We were scouting the location for the Hong Kong airport. 
and um, he uh, this was a, an old arm, army air base on uh, uh, in Marin County mm -hmm. up there, and uh, it was, it's no longer active. And but they have these uh, they have a, a an airstrip, and it has these huge World War II hangars. And but what we were looking at is this little the the firehouse um, where it was kind of a clap white clabbered sided uh, uh, wooden structure that housed the one fire engine that they used to have in there and um, and plus a little office area and um, Stephen was thinking of using that as the terminal for for the uh, Hong Kong Airport mm -hmm. and that one was uh, I guess he, I mean, we had the, we were, it was a tech scout. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And we had all the heads of departments there and Steven was there and he was looking at that, uh, that building and describing the shots. And while he was doing that, I, I saw him, he, he kept looking over at these hangars, you know, these huge world war two hangars. And then he'd go back and he'd talk some <coughs> more and then he kept looking over at those hangars again. And finally he turned to me and he said, would it be a big problem if we shot it over there instead, at, at, you know, in front of those hangars? And, uh, like, you know, what am I going to say? No, Stephen, it's fine. I think you should do that. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I just, <laughs> so that makes sense to me. And so we all follow him over <laughs> you know, to those hangars and it was better. I mean, it really made a better shot, made a better uh, scene. That was when Indiana Jones gets into the airplane and says so long fat chow or whatever it is and yeah, slams yeah. the door and it says fat chow freight yeah. and uh, <laughs> and he takes off. But, and has a small cameo with Dan Aykroyd in the same scene, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, well, actually that scene that you saw the people lined up, uh, you know, in front of the terminal and everything, uh -huh. those were all the relatives and friends. And I mean, it was like, it, it was, that was the big night to bring all your friends and everything. I mean, like everybody's family was there and, you know, so it was, it was kind of fun. Okay. <laughs> Is that, and I'm, I don't want to butcher his name, but you would later work with the director of Howard the Duck and Best Defense. Is that where you became friendly with them? Yeah. Willard, uh, Willard Hike. Hike. I, yes. I did not want to butcher his last name. Yes. Yeah. Willard, Willard Hike and, and Gloria Katz. Wild, Gloria Katz, who just passed right. away last year, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, um, actually, I'm trying to think. I guess they got my name, I think, either through Lucas or through... Um, He's being handed notes. Yeah, I am. I'm being reminded about Goonies. And, you know, oh, but, we're, uh, we're going to get to Goonies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, Willard um, and Gloria, I guess I, I first worked with them. Uh, I'm trying to remember that's what I have is best, best defense. defense, best, best defense. defense. Yes, yes, that's what it was. With Eddie Murphy, um, Dudley Moore. Right. And I, I, yes. And um, I think they got my name through either the Lucas people or. or it was I'm the same sure. year as Indiana Jones. So I'd imagine okay. that's what it was. Could be. Yeah. Was 1984. Right. And so, um, but that was an interesting movie in the sense that, you know, Eddie Murphy, I think it's only in like 20 minutes of the movie, but yeah. it was advertised as an Eddie Murphy movie. And um, I think that hurt it because people went to see the movie and, said, and then they'd tell their friends, well, he's not in it. You know, mm -hmm. it's all this other guy, you know. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. It, it didn't do well when it was released. I right. don't know how it's done since. I don't, it's not like Howard the Duck that has a cult following. Yeah, well, it, Howard the Duck, you know, came from the underground comics. Uh, back Go ahead, in, Chad. No, no. Yeah. Start geeking out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's another one of those staples of my childhood that I watched. In there. <laughs> so. so we each uh -huh. three have different specialities as far as our knowledge goes, and they always beat me with comics. So they can always mm. talk about, hey, Howard the Duck, the movie Howard the Duck, killed the comic. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it did. It killed the well, comic. Well, the, the thing is... It, it um 
it was, I don't think people knew how to take that movie. Um, no. <laughs> it, in fact, I don't know that we knew how to take that movie. It, I can tell you though, it had the best production value I could possibly have put together with the resources I had. Um, it, it looked amazing, it, really, it still does. Mm, it still looks pretty good actually. It's just that idea of, of, of Leah Thompson having sex with a duck was a bit strange. Um, yeah. And uh, Edwin would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> you <know. laughs> hey, you all no. keep your fantasies away from me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it had a, th one of the things that happened on that movie is we were shooting in a building where they used the lab. You remember uh, the scenes in the lab? Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in a building that they used to. <laughs> um, they, they used to sight in naval guns in. They, yeah. that, so it was this huge building and it was right there at the shipyards south of San Francisco. And the Enterprise, the aircraft carrier Enterprise was in dry dock at the time up on stilts. And I walked over, I was able to walk over to it. And it's like, you can't even comprehend the size of this thing while you're standing in front of it. You, you just don't understand what you're looking at right. intellectually. So it was, that was an amazing <laughs> experience. <laughs> but at any rate, um, the uh, Howard the Duck had a lot of great stories. Um, and it was, <laughs> there was the, the one of the famous, the ones I liked the best is we had a second unit that was supposed to shoot Howard um, flying an ultralight over this beautiful marsh. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, we were the way we we're going to do that is we were going to suspend an ultralight with Howard in it from the boom of a truck boom on it yeah. and we'd mount the camera on the bed of the truck and we were going to drive along the one of the levees uh around you know in the northeast bay um, yeah. in uh sacramento bay and um we had scouted this location we had the proper permits we were all set and so the second unit was show, supposed to show up on a, this certain day and shoot it. And on that day, I first went to the first unit and made sure they were off and running, uh, you know, with no problems. And then I drove over to the East Bay and Northeast Bay and, and to see how the second unit was doing. And I got there um, and I, as I was parking my car, I saw the director, the assistant director, and the camera, uh, the, the DP, um, standing there with their hands on their hips, you know, um, <laughs> staring out over the marsh. And I thought, well, why aren't they shooting? So I, I went up on the levee, and I walked up to the director. I said, why aren't you shooting? Mm -hmm. And uh, he just looked at me, and he looked out over the marsh. And I kind of followed his gaze and the water was gone. It was a sea of mud. It was just grass sticking up out of mud. And I said, where's the water? And the director said, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't really, uh, I, I saw the ranger standing nearby and I went over to the ranger. I said, where, where, where's the water? And she said, oh, we drained it last night. And I said, well, why would you do that? She said, well, we do it every time, every year this time. <laughs> and I said, well, why didn't you tell us? And uh, she said, you didn't ask. Oh. <laughs> so I learned on that day, there is no stupid question. question. <laughs> you know? No stupid. So, well, how did you fix it? Um, I had a couple of highway patrolmen with me and uh, they said, we think we know of a place you could shoot it. And they went off and scouted it real quick and they came back and they said, yeah, we can get you over to this other levee and you can shoot it there, which was the same shot. So oh, that's good. Yeah. we lucked out, <laughs> but I've gone to, sh I've scouted beaches and I've actually asked the, whoever's representing the area. I said, will the beach be here? Uh, because some beaches here in California aren't there at all times because of the tide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it go, the water goes right up to the cliff. Uh -huh. So um, I learned that, that you never 
don't don't hesitate to ask any question, no matter how stupid it sounds. Right. So, um, you you've mentioned working with Lucas, and we're we're going to mm -hmm. talk about Goonies because we have to talk about Goonies. But before Goonies, I mean, you worked on Return of the Jedi for crying out loud. Right. And yes. um, do you have any stories of working on that movie as well? Oh, I do have a near death experience on that one. Ooh, that was. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was bad. Um, we were doing uh, Jabba's Barge in the dunes uh, west of Yuma, Arizona. If there's just one, one, if you know, there's certain times where you go, if you wish you could be a fly on a wall. Mm -hmm. because that's <laughs> what, you know, for me, because I've, I've shared this story with them. Um, I didn't know Star Wars was a trilogy because the only movie I was ever introduced to was <laughs> the Jedi. I didn't know. Oh, that, really? I didn't know there was a New Hope or Empire Strikes mm -hmm. Back until I was a teenager. For crying out loud! <laughs> uh -huh. so, so Jabba's barge is like where I wish I could have just been on that day, just watching that 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 whole scene go down. So please, yeah, continue on with that story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. If, um, if you <laughs> if you remember. Um, there were like steam vents on the side of the hull of the barge. Yes. And, and to make the, that steam, we had a boiler inside the barge and, um, you know, and it would, they'd fire, the Vex guys would fire it up and know that, that steam would come out all day long. Um, when, but when we were scouting, when we were building it, it took, I realized it took 45 minutes to get from Yuma out to Buttercup Valley, which is what that's called. Um, it is. Of all the places, of all right. the names, someone shows up, we're gonna call this one Buttercup. <laughs> right. In fact, they shot Flight of the Phoenix there, the original Flight of the Phoenix was oh, shot there. Yeah, yeah. I used to land my, you know, I was able, I, if I wanted to go check on the construction of the barge, I could leave from Burbank in my airplane, land on the same runway, the dirt strip that Flight of the Phoenix created, oh, yeah. and roll right up to the barge. That's it amazing. was, that That's was, <laughs> it was, you know, but um, what, uh, I realized it was 45 minutes from Yuma to get out there, and then would be 45 minutes back, obviously, and if someone got hurt, <laughs> it would be a bad situation if they, they were seriously injured. Mm -hmm. So I always like to be prepared for these things, um, and so there's a naval air station there, in Yuma. And so I contacted them and I said, you told them what we were doing. Uh, of course, I couldn't tell them it was Return of the Jedi. I had to say, we're shooting Blue Harvest Horror Beyond Imagination. Uh, that's, <laughs> that was our cover. Right, and right. I said, but um, uh, if I have an emergency, is there any way you can help me out, out at that site if I have to evacuate somebody really fast? And uh, they said, yeah, we have helicopters that we could have standing by mm -hmm. and uh, we'll give you a radio and if you need us all you have to do is call on that radio and we'll have a chopper there in minutes and uh, I thought great so the, I, I gave the radio to the assistant director so he was carrying his show radio and that one and um, the uh, one day when we were getting started to shoot um, we had a, a guy from San Francisco one of the effects guys um he was supposed to fire up the boiler and he thought if he tightened down the safety valve that it would heat up faster and that's Ooh. like something you never ever ever do and the boiler burst and burning him over a large part of his body and um so we the immediate call was made on the radio to to the uh, Naval Air Station. They did have a helicopter there within a very few minutes, and they evacuated him to the UCLA burn unit mm -hmm. right from the set. Wow. And uh, I mean, that's the worst injury I've ever had on a movie. And wow. that, that uh, I was just thankful I, I had that situation set up, trying to drive him 45 minutes back to Yuma and yeah. then trying to deal with him there, that would have been horrendous. Yeah, that's well, good that you have you know, been forward thinking about that. Yeah. Wow. But, so, go ahead, Chad. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so 
now we now I guess we should we we should transition to your other work with Spielberg and Lucas, that being Richard Donner's The Goonies. Oh, just Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> was he not? Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. I thought Lucas was a producer. Um, <laughs> well, the best Dick Donner story. <laughs> right. Well, the the best Dick Donner story I have is I was I was like Stevens' production manager. Right. Was, right. The the second unit had its own production manager, and I was there for Steven because of Indiana Jones. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and we were shooting this shot on a on the Griffith Park golf course, where these apes were shooting in uh i mean not it was people up dressed as apes driving a golf cart across the uh the golf course and it was supposed to tie into footage that had been shot up in washington or uh or oregon i forget where they shot mm -hmm. up there and um we uh i realized that the uh footage wasn't going to cut together and so I went to Stephen and I said you know this isn't this is bright hard sunshine this isn't going to cut with that other footage and uh, he said uh, we'll call Donner up well Donner was in the cutting room uh, at that point working I think he was working on Lady Hawk um, yeah oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. and um, and I told him what our situation was I said we're we're shooting footage that's supposed to cut in with what you shot up there in the Northwest. And that was all overcast and foggy. And this is bright, hard sunshine. It's not going to work. And he said, well, can't you just shoot them under a tree uh, in the shade of a tree? And I said, well, they're driving across the golf course. So that, I don't know that that's going to work. And, um, and he said, well, do the best you can. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that's shots in the movie. Is it? No, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked about monkey. And I'm curious how much Steven Spielberg shot second unit on that. Well, some of the stuff um, we did, we shot for, I don't know, a week or two, I guess. But some of the stuff, like the stuff with in the bathroom stalls, uh, there's oh, there's scenes yeah, yeah, yeah. with the kids in the stalls here we did that that unit i worked on did that stuff um we did some of the running around and panic stuff i mean i i don't i don't remember every bit of it i have to no, sit no, no. And watch I just it didn't you know. know so spielberg shot second unit on that i didn't know that. yeah yeah i did not yeah, a clue I, I thought he was just listed as a producer i, I yeah. honestly thought he was you know one of those produced titles and walked off the set you know oh no he's steven gets involved heavily in anything that has his name on it poltergeist it's poltergeist yeah, we could, <laughs> we right. well except it. but well <laughs> i think i mean i the the stories i've heard i don't know for sure about poltergeist yeah, yeah. well we've on, heard we well we've heard many actually i never met toby hooper i had a chance to mm -hmm. didn't get a chance to but um yeah i, I think I, he was there was, he he was in the area. I know. Um, <laughs> he, was, he was in the area for the whole shooting of the movie. So, right. Yeah. But I think it was a sensitive subject for Toby. It was a sensitive subject for Toby. Anyway, I didn't know that there that he shot the second unit on Goonies. I'm, That's I'm fascinating. Shocked. Yeah, I did not know that. <clears throat> I, you, go ahead. Actually, I, I have one film that I've got to bring up just simply because I remember watching it a few times with my father. Um, you worked on Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Yeah. I did. Yes. I still one of my favorite lines that I never get to. I'll never get to you mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. still when they ask her before she's supposed to be executed, uh, "Do you smoke?" And they're going to burn her at the stake. And her response is, "Of course." I guess we'll find out. Um, <laughs> right. I'm glad, James, because yeah, because I, I was just curious about that because you know Elvira, mm -hmm. uh, Cassandra Peterson. Um, uh, that that character is so interesting hosting bad movies and then making a movie about her and, and, and all of that. I just wondered if there was any stories mm -hmm. about how that came together and, and, and the, the making of that film. Yeah. Well, again, I did post shooting on that one. We were doing added shots. Um, we did the stuff in Las Vegas where um, one, one thing we did was, was the, we had to, they needed an optical like tomorrow, you know, or the day after tomorrow, which was um, 
a shot of downtown Las Vegas, and back then it wasn't out at the Strip, you know, the, yeah. you know where all the big hotels are now. Downtown was where all the action was. Classic and then, Vegas. Classic Vegas. Right. And then where she was performing, supposedly, where her marquee was going to be, that was out at the Strip. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to dissolve from a shot of downtown, and then they wanted to uh, dissolve from that to the marquee, and uh, and then pan down. So they didn't have time to make the optical. So what they wanted us to do is one of the things we did. Uh, other there were a bunch of other shots too. We went up to Vegas in the morning uh, and rented a van. We had uh, the a camera with us and a couple of ma like a few magazines, just a small Aeroflex uh, mm -hmm. camera, and. We went downtown, uh, we set up the shot, we, we rolled on the, on the people uh, in the lights and everything down there, cut the camera and got in the van and then headed over to where the marquee had been set up for her. And all the way, all the way there, the camera assistant was winding the film back, uh, counting frames. Oh, uh, by the way, when we, when we cut the camera, first what they did is they stopped the iris down. So it went, to black right. uh, and then stop the camera. And so he was counting frames to get us back to where the dissolve had to start. And oh. then we started on the marquee with the iris stopped down. And then, then as the camera started, we opened up the iris and then panned down the marquee and uh, we had an in-camera dissolve. And we got, got on the plane, brought the film back. They processed it that night and they were able to cut it in the next day. Oh, that God. is amazing. That's, amazing. That's a cool story. Yeah. Yeah. I, if, if, no, you, no, um, did the, ex go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, we also did the exploding heads, which was kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, uh, we yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you told us a little bit about Goonies, but I'm going to ask you about another director that you may not get asked about as much as, uh, as, as of course, Spielberg. You worked with one of my favorite batshit Dutch directors. <laughs> you, know who I'm, you know where I'm going, don't you? I do. I was hoping he was going to, because if not, I was going. I, I, um, I've been a Verhoeven fan all my life. Same and man. when I say bad shit, I mean it in the sweetest way. I, I could watch documentaries right. of him directing and his kinetic, you know, energy. Yep all the time mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk about working with paul verhoeven and starship troopers and hollow man correct? showgirls as well and right? Showgirls. right and showgirls oh yeah. i forgot about showgirls right. <laughs> showgirls was your first one if you were <coughs> with paul well it was the first one we actually shot there's quite a bit that led up to showgirls well let's talk how. about talking about let's let's start from the beginning and move up so mm -hmm. what do you mean there's a lot that led okay. up to showgirls are you going to talk about the movie he almost did with schwarzenegger what's it called um even before that, and before it was, was, that the one that was in the middle crusade, the crusade, yes, crusade right. is famous for not being made. Oh, well, the, when I first uh got involved with with Paul Verhoeven and Alan Marshall, um, it was to do a film called Anne Bonnie, which was about Anne Bonnie the pirate, uh, yeah. who worked out of South Carolina. I mean, that, yeah. that was her base, Charleston, I believe, mm -hmm. and um. And the uh, we were able to, I mean, to, to do that movie. I mean, first the, the studio said uh, that they wanted it for 50 million below the line. And they didn't even have me bother with the above the line. I guess they had figures for that. So, yeah. um, so you take I was- a second, Do you mind taking a second for our audience sure. who may not know and explaining above the line and below the line? Oh, sure. Uh, above the line <laughs> is basically talent. It's, right. it's the producers, the director, and the actors mm -hmm. and their associated costs. Yeah. Um, and then below the line is everybody else. Right. Okay. Every, all the other costs in the movie. Right. So <clears throat> when um, I started budgeting it, uh, and I, and then as we were, as I was budgeting, uh, we were also scouting and I was learning, you know, how Paul wanted to shoot the movie. And I was factoring all that in and I came back. I mean, the, the scouts were amazing. We, I've been on every Island in the Caribbean. I went to, uh, Ottawa and saw the HMS Rose and we yeah. went to 
to Philadelphia and saw old Ironside. And uh-huh. I mean, it was just like this dream <laughs> you know, yeah. movie scout. Yeah. Um, it was just something I really enjoyed. I went, I did a midnight swim off the shores of Jamaica, you know, and it was like swimming in a bath, you know, a bathtub because it was so warm. Uh-huh. But, um, but at any rate, we got back and I was at 55 now <coughs> below the line. Mm-hmm. And so I, showed it to Alan Marshall and to Paul and they said, well, let's go in and see what they say. So um, we took the budget in, met with the, the head of production. And he said, no, it has to be 50 million below the line. Bring it back when you're there. And so off we went. Um, and during this time I was learning more things. Like at the time I had just seen um, a movie, uh, Geronimo by uh, directed by, um, Oh, 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 David. Um, no, not, he was, he, no, it's not David. It's uh, the Warriors, right? Walter Hill. Walter Hill. That's Walter, who I don't know Walter. why I said David. I was thinking yeah. Walter Hill, David Geiler, they produced Alien. Sorry, keep going. Right. Well, in that movie, um, there's this Calvary Indian battle on horseback. And you think there are a million horses there because you're, the camera is right in the middle of it. Horses are wiping the lens and it's moving all around. And you just think, I mean, there could have been 12 horses there. I wouldn't know. I mean, it seemed like hundreds and, you know, if not a thousand horses to me. And um, Paul had this scene in the, in the, wait a minute, what a, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm suddenly got us ahead to crusade. I'll save okay. that until we get into crusade. Okay. Um, so at any rate, did the, to make a long story short, what happened was the more I learned, the higher the budget went. We, I took it back to them. We were at 58 million and they said, look, just get it back to 55 and, and we'll be happy. We'll have a green light. Okay. And so I had all these discussions with Paul and with Alan, and there are certain things Paul didn't want to compromise on. And to really take money out of a movie, you actually have to change the movie. You have to change what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, and by that time, uh, we were nearing 60, and they shut the movie down. They said, obviously, this isn't going to work. So we then uh, transferred over to – we went from Sony to Caracol. Uh-huh. And um, – at Carol Co. Carol Co. They had this script called The Crusade, mm-hmm. and it was going to uh, be shot in. We were going to do stage work in England uh, at Pinewood. We were going to do uh, <coughs> locations in Spain, uh, mm-hmm. and we were going to do locations in Morocco, and we were going to be building costumes in uh, Rome. We were going to be building ships in Russia. We were going to be building uh, chainmail armor in Hong Kong. Uh, so it was like the crusade empire that the sun never set on. It was yeah, yeah. a world <laughs> you know, effort. And so what we did, um, we had to, have, to control all this. I had to set up, this is before the internet. So to control all this, what I was doing was um, I, I, we had fax machines. Yeah. Set up a system that any time a fax is sent to any of the offices, that the other offices would be copied. So everybody had a, a full documented, you know, f- full set of documentation. Right. Everybody knew what was going on. Um, and that was the only way I knew how to network it. Right. But um, – we the same thing started happening that and this is where the the horses came in in the scene um the schwarzenegger is leading a a column of crusaders uh in the uh mid-east and um uh 80 horses appear on the sand ridge above them and they all come riding down onto them so i budgeted for 80 horses and um and then I found out that, uh, well, I budgeted for 80 horses. And Paul said, you know, I think I need 400 horses. And I said, 
Well, that's and that's when I told him about Geronimo, Walter Hill, and the scene in there. And I said, mm -hmm. "Well, have you seen this? You know, they they did it, but much less, and it looked like more." And um, and he said, "No, I need four hundred horses." And I said, "Okay." So I put that in the budget, and um, and then a few days later, he said, "It has to be eight hundred horses." <laughs> And I said, Paul, this is getting out of hand. You really, I, I don't know how you, we can afford that. And he said, no, it really has to be 800 horses. And then I found out that um, there was this, that the Spanish horses are all like thoroughbreds. That's yep. the type of horse they have there. And the, the Moroccan horses all look like American quarter horses. And there's this disease in Morocco, a horse disease, that if you take a horse into Morocco, it can never leave because it's quarantined. So I was faced with transporting 800 thoroughbreds to Morocco and just writing them off because they could never leave then. And it was just getting insane. Um, and eventually, Carolco came to my rescue. They, had, they were doing uh, Cutthroat Island uh, at the same time, uh, they were being prepped. Mm -hmm. And we already had stages being built, sets being built in, in at Pinewood. I was renovating a castle in northern Spain. Um, and just all of this stuff was going on, buying ships in Russia and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And so the, uh, the studio said, we're shutting it down. And so they did, they, they shut it down and it, it took a while. It took a, actually a week or two to, to get everything stopped and, and, you know, start reversing it all. And, um, and Paul then felt he owed Carol Co a movie, you know? And so um, they said, uh, Mario Cazar, uh, the head of Carol Co had this script written by Joe Esterhaus. And he said, here, um, read that, see what you can do with that. And so that was Showgirls. And in that one, Paul originally said we were going to make it in black and white. It was going to be really gritty, you mm -hmm. know, realist, realism and all of this. And, um, and that's how I budgeted it at first, but it soon uh, became color and glamorous and you know, yeah. <laughs> it, it got to be larger. So, but we actually made Showgirls, as you know, and, right. Well, which one would you have rather have done, Crusade or Showgirls? I was having, I was really having a great time on Crusade. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I really, I mean, Showgirls. You know, you if you're a young man and you're thinking of you know doing a movie like Showgirls, you have all these naked women running around. Mm -hmm. You know, to tell you the truth, it really gets to be boring after a while. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, uh, I would. Well, uh, no I mean, kidding. I go on to the set yeah. and, you know, we were shooting up at Lake Tahoe and one of the casinos for the show stuff. And I'd go on to the set to talk to Paul and uh, there'd be all these naked women on the stage. And uh, then uh, I, I, as I walked in, I'd see all the grips off in a corner playing cards while they were shooting mm -hmm. and not even looking. I mean, they, were, <laughs> they just had it. They, they were totally done with it yeah. But, um yeah it it was it was strange i mean it was like i'd be talking to paul and elizabeth berkeley would come right up without a robe or anything and just stand there and join the conversation and i mean you know i just tried to flow with it uh it was very unusual for me though <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, hmm? Go no go ahead finish your thought i was we were shooting at raleigh studios and i was headed into the stage one day and those stages on the outside door there's a, a glass window about head height mm -hmm. so you can see if there's somebody coming in or out and um as i was uh walking up to the door i saw elizabeth i saw her face you know coming towards the door so i pulled the door open and held it open ready to say hi elizabeth and and out she comes without a stitch on and she goes oh hi bob and heads off to her car <laughs> and I went into the, the AD and I said, you know, she's out there without anything on. Would you get her back inside or at least take her a robe? And so she did. <laughs> but I, she was really into the part. 
That's what I was about to say. Did she just get into the part? Was it a method I acting so. thing? Well, that yeah, was supposed I to be that, so. that was supposed to be her breakout movie from Saved by the Bell. Well. Right. So I so, thought she was yeah. taking mm-hmm. very seriously. Yeah. Did you know that it would be become what it's become? Did you I had it? no idea. I it, the, see when it was first released, nobody went to see it because right. they were embarrassed. And it what happened at the time too, as well, right? It, it was released in C seventeen, correct? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um. And in fact, the rentals have gone out of sight on that movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's funny how things change over time because <clears throat> you're right. It was panned. It was hated. It, it mm-hmm. didn't do any business. And now I mean, Paul. Go ahead. Paul, Paul was uh, awarded the Raspberry that year that yeah, it was yeah. released. And, um, and he went to accept it. I mean, he oh, had. Really? He, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. He went and he gave an acceptance speech and, and the whole thing. Um, and he was, uh, you know, he was, he, he just felt it was what it was, you know. And he, uh, I remember when we went to the, to the screening, um, my wife and I, uh, when, when it was over, we came down the stairs and Paul was reading, and we were, because we were seated up in the balcony. And, um, and she, uh, he was kind of standing down there with his arms crossed uh, and I walked up to him and I said, so that was what you were yelling about all that time. <laughs> <laughs> and he say? just laughed. Oh, huh? <laughs> well, he, he sounds like he has a great sense of humor. Oh, he does. He's, he's a really nice person. And I mean, Almost on every picture I've worked with him on, there comes a day when we go head to head. And usually I'll, I'll say, look, I'll come back later. You know, uh, let, let's talk it over then. And so then he'll usually call me up and say, why don't you come down and then we'll discuss it. And um, it's, it's typically when, um, well, I'm I'm keep being told that I should I should mention that he is brilliant. <laughs> he is, um, and no, I, he is he lives. He is. I love all of his films. Yeah, there isn't. What you may not know about him is he has a PhD in mathematics. Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, he had a, and he had a um, was it after his PhD or during graduate school? He had a nervous breakdown, right? I'm not aware. Yeah, that. it's it's true. But I'm familiar with a lot of his other. Um, before America, like a soldier of orange spetter. Right. Sorry. Yeah. What's the, what's the, the fourth what's, man. What's the Dutch movie with Rutger Hauer where they're, they're in the castle. Oh, oh that's uh, what, flesh and blood. It, it, yeah. Yeah. yeah flesh and blood. Yeah. I love that movie. So yeah. <laughs> See, the thing, before I worked with him, I watched that movie and mm-hmm. it was, I'm used to uh, movies where people change and, you know, they grow in the movie. Mm-hmm. And in that movie, everybody goes through absolute hell through the entire movie yes. and end up right where they started. <laughs> started, absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. And part of that, you know, and that's basically, I think, his, his nihilism, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he, uh, he just, he, I mean, but, I mean, it was, he's a brilliant filmmaker. He truly yeah, I know is. he is. And I do movies. Um, I, I'm not a, as huge a fan of Hollow Man, but I, we love Starship Troopers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really? That one. That yeah. yeah. I mean, it, all of these shows have have stories. <coughs> but, uh, Starship Troopers. The the biggest frustration, I guess, the event that caused me the most frustration was when um, they picked the house for Johnny Rico, where mm-hmm. his parents lived, and um, before the location manager showed it to him, uh, I mean, showed the uh, director, I wanted to see it uh, and I wanted the production designer to see it. I think, I guess the production designer had seen it, yeah. but I wanted to see it. And, um, and I ended up seeing it when Paul saw it. Uh, and it was, the house was plated in stainless steel, brushed stainless steel. And so it was real unusual. It was owned by an attorney in the Malibu Hills. Uh, and the problem with it was it had this long, curvy, single lane driveway 
that did have a turnaround spot at the end of it in front of the house, but we had built uh, the transporter machine uh, in that turnaround spot, so it couldn't be used to turn around. So I had no way to get the equipment up to the uh, to to the house. You know, my, it was going to take forever. We were going to have to hoof it up or something. So I. I asked the grips, you, do you have any ideas how to do this? And they said, well, we could rig up a cable system. We could fly this stuff up and down. And I said, well, what would that cost? And it seems to be the number everybody goes to. He said, $50,000. <laughs> and, um, and I said, well, that's not going to work. And then somebody else suggested a helicopter. And again, there was no place for a helicopter to land or operate. So I knew that wasn't going to work and it would be expensive. So I went to my transportation coordinator, his name's Jim Chesney, and uh, he uh, he's also uh, very good at his job. And I said, how can I get the equipment up there? And he said, we'll just buy gators. I mean, not get, we'll rent gators, which are basically gas powered golf carts with a little truck bed on the back of them. Yep. And uh, we- For some reason run. I got a picture of a bunch of live gators. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> with stuff strapped on their back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a different kind of movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that, and that worked great because we could, they could pass each other on the driveway and so on. But, but the thing about Starship Troopers um, was, I mean, we had, the, the problems were so different, but we did end up in, um, we were shooting outside uh, <coughs> in Wyoming, Casper, Wyoming, in a place called Hell's Half Acre. Hell's That's Half where the bug fight is, you know, in the fort and all that. And um, You've got it was really an interesting place to shoot. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You got the most interesting location names, Buttercup, Catch Me Can. Hell's Half Acre. Well, I, I know, don't but know still. Why, I don't know why I knew that, but I knew <laughs> It's, a, it's an interesting canyon because it's made out of pumice and, and volcanic debris, I, wow. but light white volcanic debris. And I was finding fossil uh, jaws of, of like, I don't know, antelopes or something mm -hmm. in there. And it was, it was really an interesting place to be. And what happened was um, one day I, I get a call from the set and there had been a flash flood that went right through the canyon and washed away uh, some parts of our set and a bunch of equipment and, and so on. So uh, we had to shut it down. We could, we, it was difficult even getting the uh, crew out because we had built a road to go down in there and that got washed out. So we got the crew out. Um, couple of grips got washed down a few hundred feet uh, but we got them all safe and sound and um, and we were picking up equipment for days after that but we fortunately I'd brought the shower set uh, and put that in a warehouse there as a cover set so yeah. we went in and started shooting the, the, the shower scene. So you didn't lose days right? No we didn't but we did have an insurance claim and that was a big one. Yeah. All right. James, well, James, go for it. I, I, I wanted to bring up one uh, thing. You're, you're credited as a producer <coughs> uh, and a unit production manager for uh, Babylon 5, The Gathering, which I think is what launched the Babylon 5 television series and things like that. Right. I've been actually introducing my son to that. Uh, so I just wanted to know, you know, uh, how did – that go and and how was the setup for that it went very well actually um the uh, we did some amazing things on that show for instance all of the visual effects the spaceships and those organic looking spaceships mm -hmm. thing, those were done on us on uh eight video toaster computers personal computers that had been networked and all those shots were rendered on those computers. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been involved with digital effects, actually. And um, it, the, uh, the, the biggest problem I had, I, you know, I guess you're, I'm giving you a lot of like inside production behind oh, the scenes no, stuff. This is what we no, love, this, this is, is what, what we love, okay. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. Well, I came into my office one morning and uh, there was this woman sitting in my office and I 
said, hi, uh, can I help you with something? And she said, well, uh, I hope you can. Uh, and she introduced herself and she was from Cal OSHA, which is the California Occupational Safety and Hazard uh, Administration. And I said, oh, okay, what can I do for you? And um, she said, well, I'm here to find you $10,000. <laughs> Okay. And I said, really, you want to elaborate? What had happened, you know, set, uh, set builders, like the, the construction crew, they always remove the guards from the table saws because there are certain cuts the guard is just in the way and they just, they just take them off and they, they don't want to be bothered with them. And well, one of the construction crew evidently had been cutting a board and reached across to to pick up the short end uh, or the cutoff piece and the, as the blade was spinning down and nicked his thumb very just like uh, enough for one stitch basically yeah. but he did nick his thumb and he they took you know we, we had first aid standing by we always do and um the first aid person took him to the hospital the emergency room and they stitched him up and they said, how did this happen? And he said, well, and he explained it. And they said, so this was a work-related accident. He goes, yeah, it was work-related. And, um, and they sent him on his way. Um, I'd had other people go to hospitals like this without a problem, you know, on previous shows. Well, I wasn't aware, and this is my fault, I wasn't aware that they had instituted new regulations. You had to have a safety plan. You had to have it posted. You had to have, uh, you know, you had to have, make sure all the guards were on the equipment. And basically, the fines amounted to $10,000, and we paid them. But um, it was an expensive lesson for me. <laughs> Jesus, no, they didn't take yeah. that out of your check, I hope. <laughs> no, <laughs> fortunately not. Okay, mm -hmm. so I want to talk a little bit about your producing because you have worked with a little killer doll more than once. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, you, were a, you were an assistant director on part three, if I'm not mistaken. And you were a producer on part two and three, correct? Um, well, I was, a, I was a production manager on part one. Uh -huh. Okay, sorry. And then uh, I was executive producer on part two, uh, okay. and it was it was a I was actually producing it, but um, uh, that's the title they gave me was executive producer. And then on three, Kirshner said, "Look, he was involved with um, with Hanna Barbera at the time, yeah. And so he said, "Look, you just do it." And uh, and you take the producing credit. He was You're talking about David Kirshner. Just David Kirshner, right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. well, And so that's that's how those worked. Well, obviously you hit it off with them if you were able mm -hmm. to go ahead because the first one was made for MGM when you were the when you were over the production, correct? Right. Yes. And the other two, the sequels were made for Universal. Right. The 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 second one started out as a UA picture, United Artists, uh -huh. and then they put us in turnaround. When, when we were prepping yeah. uh, and we took it to Universal and they picked it up. And, uh, and so we ended up, but Universal wanted us to do it as a non-union picture. Now Universal is a union lot. Mm -hmm. And what they wanted to do was to see if they could um, do a non-union picture on their lot. And what they did is they assigned us a specific gate, it's called the Barham gate. Mm -hmm. And um, we only were to go in and out of that gate. Anybody associated with our picture, any deliveries, everything was to go in and out of that gate. And um, so uh, we, and we went along fine. And uh, we had a non-union crew who had the union had no control over them. And uh, it got to the point where the union started picketing my people walked right through the picket line and we kept going. And so then they started picketing all the gates and they, one day I got to work and they had shut down the lot except for my picture, which was shooting because my people came on and kept shooting. And, um, Oh, uh Oh, Hello? I think we lost you. Are you there? So I'm sorry. 
We had a little yeah. bit of a, a little bit of a lag. So yeah, I, I saw that. Okay. Sorry about that. So your last thing is they had shut down all the lot. They shut down all the pictures except yours because your non-union, your people were non-union and they right. left off. So you were saying. So then um, <coughs> they called me from the t Black Tower, which is the executive building in mm -hmm. at Universal, and um, asked me to come up and talk to the. Uh, to the business agents of the unions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, why? Why do I want to do that? And they said, well, they said they'd pull off all the pickets off the gates if you would come talk to them. I said, oh, okay. So I went up to, to that office and um, they told me uh, that all the business agents were there and they were not pleased with me at all, obviously. <laughs> And they said, um, I, I said, they started in on me right, right away. And I said, wait a minute, before we, we go any further, can you tell me if um, you've pulled the pickets off the gates? And they said, no. And I said, well, I was under the understanding that if I came up here to talk to you guys, that that would happen. And then they started saying I was taking an attitude and all of this. And the vice president of the lot who had asked me to come up there said, well, um, uh, I actually didn't tell you uh, the, the, the correct situation. They, they didn't say that. <laughs> so he lied to me. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, now I know where we stand. Let, you know, what do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. And um, so what they did, um, they wanted to hold an election, which is, is their right to do if this, if, and let the crew decide if they want to unionize or not you will typically always lose that election because their benefits increase and, and their, some of their pay will increase. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, and then once they, once they hold the election, you have to negotiate a contract. So I had part of, um, we held the election, we lost the election. Uh, so we had to set up negotiating days. And so, I kept trying to set up a day to talk to them and they were always out of town at a retreat or they were here or they were there. It went on for weeks. And then finally, two weeks before we were going to finish shooting, I finally got to sit down and talk to them and work out a contract. And of course my guys aren't, are still working on non-union mm -hmm. benefits right now. And, um, and one of the things I negotiated is that, I wanted everybody who was on the show to be able to join the union if they desired, because they were all non-union people. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they agreed to that. Because normally you have to have 30 days on one show, right. or you have to have 90 days on multiple shows. And so I, I said, you know, I'd like that to be possible for them. Mm -hmm. And they agreed. And so... And so they they were going to retroactively count their time, you know, not because uh, otherwise they would only have two weeks uh, left on my movie. And um, so after that, we finally, we start, you know, they went under the union contract for those two weeks and we wrapped. Okay. Oh, and we, one of the, the top, our, our, our key special effects guy uh, did not join the union. And I asked him why because he's a really good effects guy. Um, and he said, because I'm a big fish in the non-union world. He says, nobody knows me in the union world. I said, makes sense. Yeah. Well, was, was Universal just trying to use you guys as a... We like, were a test. Just a test to see if they could yeah. get away with it? On a, yeah. Yeah. So how did... But did uh, I, Back to our story, how did you get the producer job on Child's Play and Child's Play 3? You just were friends with David Kirshner or you just hit it off or... Well, he, he just asked me um, after Child's, I mean, we, we hit it off really well after yeah, Child's yeah, Play yeah. 1. He's, he's a, a friend of mine now. I mean, oh, okay. He, and um, we, we have, um, he just asked me when, when we finished that, he said, we're, we're going to do Child's Play 2. Uh, do you want to uh, produce it? And mm -hmm. I said, yeah. And so he had me take the executive producer title on that. And then we immediately after we finished Child's Play 2, we immediately started on three, but it got delayed because we were having trouble finding a, a director. 
we eventually ended up with Jack Bender, who did eventually went on to do Lost. Lost, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. <laughs> did some huge television work? Yeah. I oh, don't yeah. Remember who directed Child's Play too? But I do know Jack uh, Bender directed. Yeah, Child's, Child's Play two was John Lafia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, what other movies did we want to ask about? Okay. Uh, actually, I wanted to just real quick, uh, not movie related, but you have actually written a book to help other people figure out the budgeting of low budget films and things like that called planning the low budget <laughs> film. Yes. How, how did that book come about? And, and it, it, it's, I believe won some awards. It's got a lot of attention. And yes. I just wondered um, about kind of how that Genesis started. Well, it's, it started, um, be, you know, I was teaching as an adjunct. I, you know, I, I mentioned I'd been doing that since 1996, yeah. uh, an adjunct at USC. Um, and the class I'm, I teach is production planning, basically. I've taught other classes here and there, but uh, that's my main course that I've taught every, every semester. And um, we, uh, I found myself doing lots of Xeroxing, uh, you know, every year, every semester. And I thought, you know, I should put all this in a book <laughs> so I don't have to keep doing the Xeroxing. So I just, one summer I wrote the book um, and, and it really was interesting because it made me have to think, well, why do I do things the way I do them? How, why do I break a script down a specific way? Why do I do certain things in a budget? Because those students, as you guys know, uh, aren't going to take any BS. They want to know why and they want a reason. They don't want to hear, oh, that's how we've done it for a hundred years. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to be able to back up what I was teaching them. So it was it was really instructive for me to be able to go through that process and and basically I just take them through the steps uh, from getting a script, breaking it down, scheduling it, uh, finding locations, creating the budget, uh, and that sort of thing. Just going through the whole thing. Yeah. So how can people get your book? It's on Amazon. Okay. Um, it's. I'll, all they have to do is go to Amazon and, and either look up Robert Latham Brown or they can look up planning the low budget film. They should know that they, that what they want to get is the second edition. That's the, the latest. Okay. Robert Latham Brown, Amazon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Got it. Right. Oh, is there anything else before we go? You know, um, let's just, uh, we'll close on this one. Um, mm -hmm. You did some additional work on one of the movies that basically has defined a genre uh, the superhero genre with Spider-Man. Could, could mm -hmm. you, do you have any stories about working on that movie? We're big Sam Raimi fans. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's a very nice man. Um, so um, you'll be glad to know that. Um, the, um, I, I did the post-production. I kind of supervised post-production for that. I did post-production shooting and then all of the other producers had to leave. I mean, Ian Bryce went off to do Tears of the Sun, I think, with mm -hmm. Antoine Fuqua. Um, and I, the other producer's name is Skippy, the, the woman. Um, I forget her name, but she had to go. She was going to produce the Oscars that year, so oh. she she couldn't mm -hmm. hang around, and so I got to do it, which was I was thrilled. And um, we did some of the the scene. We did where the Green Goblin uh, is killed. Uh, we did that scene. We we did several of the other scenes. We did a uh, scene uh, in the uh, <coughs> uh, in the mansion. Uh, there was something on the stairwell or something. I forget exactly mm -hmm. what it was, but um, and it it, it was a, a really interesting shoot to be a part of. I I really enjoyed it. Uh, no no horrendous things happened. Uh, we that's okay. <laughs> we we had a, it went very smoothly actually. I was really pleased. All right, two questions before we go. One. Mm -hmm. What's the one that got away or what's the movie you wish you've got, you would have gotten to make that either you worked in pre-production or it almost happened, or you just wish you would have got to work on it. Do you have another 30 minutes? Yes. Oh God. No, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm oh, kidding. God. We're not kidding. We'll take all the time. <laughs> you good. are doing no. us the favor. <laughs> and we well, love, no, these I, and we love these. Stories. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm joking, but uh, cause it, there's, you end up having to make choices. 
uh, and sometimes, you know, you, you have to work, you have to yeah. go out and get the job. And so um, you take what comes. And sometimes you get offered the really great picture after you took the okay picture, you know. Um, but I've always, you know, I, I don't just say, oh, I got a better offer and leave. You know, I, that, I just don't think that's right. So if I've agreed to do something, I do it. And uh, there have been a couple instances. Oh, one of them was... Um, Yeah, you know, color purple. <laughs> that was. Uh, oh, wow. uh, I had been asked uh, to do that one, but I was already on. I had already committed. Uh, another one that I didn't uh, get was uh, "Man Without a Face." Uh huh. Oh, yeah, with Mel that was with. Um, you know, yeah, Mel Gibson. Yeah. Um, because again, I was I was involved in another picture. There's some I've turned down. Um, the the one the main one I turned down was Pet Cemetery. Because oh. at the time, yeah, at the time I was, uh, I had a two-year-old son. Oh. And the, on the first page, this two-year-old kid gets run over by a Mack truck. You know, <laughs> I, just, yeah. I, I just didn't even want to put that energy out there, you know. Nope. I, I, I can't well, watch that film now that I have We're children. all fathers, so I now have a two-year-old. Ah. And I have seen the original and saw the remake, and I saw the remake in the theater by myself. Oh. And even though they switched it, I, I totally understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It just yeah. changes your entire perspective. Yeah. I, I just Falling. didn't want to have anything to do with those kinds of thoughts. Yeah. 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 I understand. Yeah. So those are the ones that didn't get away. What do you got coming up? What do you want to tell our audience that you've got coming up? Well, actually, I have a, a couple projects with, with David Kirshner, which we hope to get going. Um, I, I can't really say much about him at this point. Would this um, be a TV show with a doll? No, it won't be. <laughs> I mean, he is working on that. I know. I was it getting is. close. I was, right. I was thinking maybe. How about this? Is it a fish police revival? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this is this will be um these are very different pictures um okay. there's the other the other thing that i'm working on that is done i've written it uh and it's called um xena and johnny x-e-n-a x-e-n-a and johnny um and what it is is about xena the warrior puppy now you can google xena the warrior puppy and see the whole what, what it's all about but basically she was a pit bull um, mix puppy that was abandoned and left for dead uh, and rescued when they found this dog you can see the pictures if you look it up when they found this dog it looked like somebody had stretched thin leather over um, a, a skeleton mm -hmm. that's that's how terrible it, uh, shape she was in and what uh, happened is she was adopted by a woman uh, named Linda Hickey, whose son Johnny has autism. This is a true story, and they they live uh, in that they live rough. out that's right. Yeah, they live outside uh, out Atlanta, mm -hmm. and um, and she uh, she ended up adopting uh, Zena. And up until when Johnny was eight, he was basically nonverbal. Uh -huh. He had the ability to speak, but he didn't speak. Um, he uh, and he was very antisocial. He couldn't be around people. He wouldn't allow anybody to come to the house and that sort of thing. So it was very difficult. And they, Linda and her husband and and Johnny's older brother, have given a tremendous given you know, a lot of themselves to, to caring for him. And um, when Zeno came into his life, when Linda picked him up from school and Zeno was a surprise, well, let me back up. The way I got interested in it is I saw this newsreel and, uh, and what it was is Zena had, when she got nursed back to health, she was, um, they had, a meet and greet at a, on the patio of a pizza place. And um, so, and they invited people to come meet Zena and they were looking for a family for Zena. Mm -hmm. And Linda s happened to see the story. The story was followed on local television in Atlanta for, you know, 
its from its beginning. And um, she had been following the dog as well. And when she heard about the meet and greet, she wanted to go. And so she took her husband and Johnny and they went to this meet and greet. And you can see in the, they had a local news crew there. And you can see the, uh, they were following Zena, going up to all these different, this line of people who were there lining up to meet her. And, um, and all of a sudden she stops and she turns her head and the camera pans over and you can see Linda and her husband Grant and Johnny in the far background. Mm -hmm. And Zena just takes off for Johnny and heads right to him and covers him with kisses like they were long lost lovers. They, you know, they finally met each other. And he was thrilled. They thought they were worried at first that he was going to totally melt down because of this, but um, but he didn't. And uh, he really enjoyed meeting Zena. But that was, they, they had no idea they could ever adopt her. But Linda then uh, gave, put in an application, ended up adopting Zena and picked up Johnny from school with Zena in the car without telling him that Gina was there. And as soon as uh, he got in the car, Zena leaps uh, from the back seat up to where Johnny was in the middle seat and um, starts again covering him with kisses and Johnny's going, my puppy, my puppy. And, mm -hmm. um, and on the way, uh, he starts singing, you got a friend in me. And he starts talking to Zena and starts, you know, talking about you got a nose, I have nose, you have two eyes, I have two eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this sort of thing. And it was, just was a, a, an amazing turnaround for him. Wow. Now in the script, I have to, you know, I need a third act because this is, <laughs> this is the midpoint, <laughs> you know. So, and in the, so in the script, there's a, a problem with, with having, being able to keep Xena. And uh, I'm getting more. Oh, yeah, if you go to the dodo, there's a three minute video oh, that yeah, has their yeah. story. Um, and Zena ended up being the ASPCA dog of the year in 2013. Wow. Yeah. And the most amazing dog I think I've ever met. She's, if you, I mean, if a dog can be charismatic, this dog is. I mean, so did you, did you contact the family and say, I want to write the screenplay and then just started to spend time with them? Can you tell well, me? The, the interesting thing how that happened was um, I had been contacted by a writer who lives also outside of Atlanta and um, a young, young writer, uh, mm -hmm. like in his early 20s. Yeah. And he had sent me a screenplay he wrote and I wasn't. So uh, right where we left off, um, and thank you, so, we're sorry about that. Right where right. we left off, you were contacted by a young writer outside of Atlanta. Right. And he sent me a, a script that I wasn't, uh, it wasn't really what I was looking for. And so I wanted to call him and tell him why, why I didn't want to, you know, <coughs> in the script. Mm -hmm. And um, his name's Ryan Shuby, and uh, very, very smart young man. And uh, he... Uh, what he did was um, we started talking and, and I asked him about himself and, and he mentioned that he had Tourette syndrome. Mm -hmm. And um, I had only one encounter with someone else with Tourette syndrome who had uh, coprolalia, you know, with, that's how it, it exhibited with him. Mm -hmm. And, um, but Ryan um, does not, have that uh and what he uh i asked him i said well how has that affected your life and he started telling me how it affected his life and what it had meant you know how he had to deal with things and so on and um i said that's the story i'd like to read send me that one Mm -hmm. And which he did. He wrote that script, sent it to me. We unfortunately couldn't get the money together for that. We tried for years to get that together. But in the meantime, his mother had met Linda Hickey, the mother of Johnny, um, and mentioned that her son was a writer. And she said, well, I'd like him to write my son's story. And um, so, and then, uh, Ryan uh, asked me if I would be a part of that. And so I, I said, yes, it sounds, that's when I went and I watched the newsreel and I said, it's, 
it seems like it'd be a great story. And so um, he basically wrote the first draft. Um, and then I rewritten it twice since uh, to get it, uh, you know, to be more what people are telling me they want. And um, so now it's, it's ready to go. And I'm just, I'm just looking for, for the money at this point. Yeah. But it's it would be an inspiring story. It really would. And these people, the Hickeys, they're ama an amazing family. Yeah, that's great. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, talking um, to us for I, plus hours. So. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully it's not been as bad as you thought it would be. <laughs> no. Not at all. all I right. mean, not even Community close. Service hours. I'll Community <laughs> service hours are done. <laughs> no. You don't have to worry about all those possession charges now. I, but anyway, thank you so much, Mr. Brown. We appreciate it. We're going to sign off, and then we'll, if you don't mind, we'll talk to you really quick as soon as we do that, okay? Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you so thank much you for, for inviting me. All right. Okay. Just go ahead. And all right.